it's not like what what we oftentimes talk about in Western culture is, you know, you know, we should be sort of as we're kind of scattering everywhere, we should be having weekday dinners together, which totally is great. But we but what what I'm saying is um, one meal. It's not about just sort of catching up before we, you know, all go our separate ways, rush to our rooms, go play our video games, you know, watch separate movies. None of that. Like, no, this evening we're staying together like like we try to do on Thanksgiving. You know, so we're going to if you if you put that stake in the ground and as a father right now, if you're listening to this, if you're if you're picturing, I want to craft a, me- a meal or an experience once a week. It could be any night of the week. I don't it doesn't matter. But I want to craft a meal so that when my kids grow up and start having kids, they can't they, they can't imagine not wanting to be there if they're in town. Episode number ninety nine. You can get all the show notes and resources at dadhackers.us slash zero nine nine. What's up, Dad Hackers? My name is Patrick Antonucci, and I am the host and founder of this podcast and community of Dad Hackers. Dad Hackers is a community of Christian fathers who are devoted to encouraging, equipping, and enabling one another to become the men that God has created and called us to be so that we can raise up the next generation of fully devoted followers of Christ and leave a legacy of multi-generational faithfulness. Now, on this show, we primarily interview Christian men to dive deep into their experiences and insights into what it means to be a Christian man, a Christian husband, a Christian father, and a Christian leader. We ask questions that dig deep into the thinking and rationale and experiences of these men so that we can all learn and grow into the men that God is calling us to be. I'm so thankful that you've joined us today. Make sure you subscribe so that you never miss any of our value-packed episodes. Also, please make sure you leave an honest review if you're listening to this in iTunes or any other platform that takes reviews. Reviews boost the show's ratings, which means that more dads are going to come across our show and benefit from the content that we put out. I also wanted to let you know that we do have a free private Facebook group just for Christian dads. So after the show, make sure you hop on over to the show notes. There's a link for that in there as well. Jeremy, brother, thank you for coming on the show today, man. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Glad to be here, Patrick. Yeah, yeah. I've been looking forward to this conversation since we set it up. And uh, I think a lot of what we're going to talk about today is, is going to really resonate with a lot of guys and it's going to give them maybe some takeaways and some action points that they can um, that they can begin implementing with their families so that we can impact the kingdom. Um, awesome. Why don't you start off and tell us a little bit about yourself for people who may have not come across your content yet or what you're doing, just so we can get a, uh, an, an idea of where you're coming from. Yeah, totally. So, my name is Jeremy Pryor. I have uh, five kids. Uh, their ages are from 20 years old down to 11. Um, we live in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I'm uh, involved in trying to figure out how did God design family and what does it mean to sort of restore the biblical blueprint of family. One of the things that, um, you know, from my story, just family was not something that excited me. Fatherhood was not uh, anything I was particularly interested in. And growing up in the Christian world, being very committed to Jesus, wanting to follow him with my whole life. I never saw a very straight line between that passion and being a dad. Those things felt almost mutually exclusive other than, you know, provide for your family, be nice to your kids, you know, share the gospel with them at some point, you know, so they come to faith. But, you know, that, that was, that was basically, uh, basically it. And, um, yeah, my story really, um, centers around in terms of fatherhood, um, an experience that I had in Israel as a 23 year old single dude, um, who again was not that interested in fatherhood or family and just saw a different model that was, uh, when I dug into it was really told it was based on Abraham. And so just pulling back, I became very inspired by the blueprint that is articulated in the Hebrew scriptures and reinforced in the new Testament. Um, about fatherhood, which is, um, I think, best described as a multi-generational team on mission. And so um, we can unpack that. But as I got deeper into understanding what that was like, it just fired me up. I got so excited about what it meant to build a family. It completely integrated with my faith and passion to follow Jesus with my whole heart. 
And uh, so I've been really trying to get the word out to dads that, you know, maybe what's happened is that in the Christian world, we've been really influenced by a different idea of family than is biblical. Uh, and I think it's really causing a lot of problems and particularly a lot of fathers to not resonate with fatherhood in general. And so, yeah, that, that's uh, what I'm passionate about. I do that through um, an organization called Family Teams. And so that's uh, kind of gets at the crux of what we're trying to do is transform families that might be like more of a collection of individuals into a team. And so uh, just building tools around that and uh, talking to moms and dads about that uh, throughout the Christian world. That sounds really good, man. I, I think we're going to have, uh, well, I, I already have a lot of questions I want to ask you, but one thing that you hit on, and, and I've heard you talk about this before, that really resonated with me is this multi-generational view of the family. And that's something mm-hmm. that that is really heavy on my heart. I think lots of times uh, men just, if they're not just thinking primarily about themselves and, and they actually branch out into the family, they're they're thinking, like you said, how, how can I raise my kids in a Christian home so that they become saved adults? And then that kind of right. stops there. Um, and God kind of really opened my eyes and my heart um, over the years to this idea that it's not just about our kids, but it's the trajectory in the culture. And, and like you said, the team that we're building in our home, that's going to set a course on a, a multi-generational view of what we do, not just looking to our kids, but our grandkids and our great grandkids and the impact that we can have in that legacy that we can build on down through the generations. Um, and it's much bigger than just yeah. raising our current generation of children. And um, mm-hmm. so that, that event in Israel, was that, was that kind of like the turning point? You said you were 23 years old or did that, was that like the starting point? I guess what I'm saying is, um, did that totally shift your view on things moving forward? Or did you like then get married, begin having children, and then this kind of evolved after you had children? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally. Definitely the second. Like, basically, what I what I experienced in Jerusalem was, oh, there are pe- people whose faith was formed by the Hebrew scriptures they have a completely different vision of family than what I experienced in kind of evangelical Western church. And I had to ask the question, like, did, did, does the new Testament fundamentally alter that? So as I uh, got married shortly after those experiences of being around uh, these Jewish families and Jewish households uh, to then beginning coming back to America and building a family in the West and in the midst of sort of Western evangelical culture, I just constantly went back to, okay, now what, what does it say? How did Abraham see this? How have Jewish families tried to figure this out over the years? And the more I did that, uh, and the more I really dove deeper and deeper into those ideas, that the more healthy my family got, the more excited about fatherhood that I became, mm-hmm. the more in sense of how God even designed the family, like all these things started coming online. And it was sort of like, wow. Like, and, and so it was definitely a, you know, a 10 year process after that initial sort of epiphany before things started the whole framework uh, for how to uh, raise a family into a multi-generational team on mission. And then ever since then, it's been, you know, trying to figure out increasingly what this looks like. But yeah, that it was definitely a, a pretty lengthy process for us. Yeah. Yeah. That, that That's interesting. So you, you've pretty much written a book about this called family revision and mm-hmm. Um, I, I'd like to, to kind of dive into the book. W- was that what really prompted you to, to write the book is being able to communicate this idea and this practice, if you will, to other people? Or what, what was the reason for wanting to put this into, into a book? Yeah, it seems, it just seemed like it, being a paradigm. And I, I kept looking, I'm, I'm not, you know, I didn't see myself as a professional writer. And so I never... I never really set out to write a book, but I definitely uh, kept looking for every resource I could find anywhere that described family in this way. And it was so difficult um, to find particularly someone starting from where I started and where I feel like most dads, if I listen to this, most dads in Christian culture are starting from and then walk them into 
this paradigm that 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 kind of writing definitely didn't exist and so yeah it was sort of uh it, it, it as i we we started going back to israel as a family i just began to do more and more research and i began to write the book i started out as just a google doc that i shared with my friends for about eight or nine years it got passed around and then just in the last um, few months we finally published it you know on amazon audible and everything and it's been really fun to finally have something that's like okay guys um, it's a, it's a, there's a lot of implications to this transition <laughs> and it's just not easy to figure out, okay, what, what are those steps? And a lot of times, you know, it's, it's, these are such different ways of viewing family that it's one of those, you have to, you have to go pretty deep into the paradigm and you have to ask a lot of questions for it to really take root. Man, once it does, I've just seen this eruption of clarity and energy, particularly out of dads. And so that's, that's what really inspired me to want to want to publish it. That sounds good, man. And, and I'm hoping we can, we can dig into some of that, obviously in, in 40 minutes or so, we're not going to be able to get, get super deep, but hopefully we can scratch the surface enough or scratch the itch enough that, that we can um, begin getting some movement on this. And I'm, I'm curious why the word revision? You call it family revision. How, how, why revision? Yeah. So there's a couple of different ways that you know, I think about the title. So family needs a revision. Um, and there's really, there's, 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 the, there's sort of a revision, like re-envisioning what family is. Um, and that's, that's kind of one way to think about it, um, that we need kind of a, from the past, like using the word re, you know, that, that prefix re, it's like, there's, it needs to be restored. It needs to be uh, redeemed. Um, and I think that all of those things come from, first of all, seeing it differently, See, you know, and, and so you're not, what we're, what we're doing is we're not inventing a new way of doing family. Um, we're really finding the original blueprint of family and attempting to articulate that uh, to a modern audience. And so that's, that's, uh, that's what that requires. But when people get a hold of that, the, the a common experience is that they do go through sort of a revisioning process of their family, kind of the more traditional way of thinking about that word. Um, they have to rethink things. The reason you guys is um, almost every single tool we have in our culture is designed for the family as a collection of individuals. It's not designed for the family to do it together. You know, schools, churches, shopping malls, sports teams, everything like that is designed to take your family, split it into its individual pieces, and then to experience life as an individual, often in a peer group or a life stage group. And that is just not the way God designed us to primarily live our lives. There's anything wrong with those experiences. I think they're great to have, but but you just where are you going to go if you're like, okay, I want my whole family to experience sports together. I want my whole family to be educated together. I want to have a church or worship experience together as a family. It's just really hard. That's just not the way we've designed our culture. And so that's where so much revisioning has to happen. If you want to make this shift, because you're going to be constantly fighting upstream against the way things are designed. Yeah. And that's something I'd like to eventually get into is like, how do we start? Because, um, you know, I'd like you to share some of that, that blueprint and some of that model. But then once we understand that, like, how do we start? Because we're so entrenched in this, the way that we're used to doing family and, and all these things and sports and education yep. and, and church and whatever it is. Um, and so I, we need a starting point, I guess, or, or some, I, I don't know, action steps, if you will, to, to getting started. But could you maybe give the, I don't know if it's a 30,000 foot view of the blueprint of what, this whole concept that we've been kind of skirting around this in this whole conversation of how we're kind of going back to what, what God really intended with families and what we're currently doing in Western civilization is not necessarily that. So what, it, what does that right. look like? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll contrast the two. So if you ask most Christian dads, like, you know, what does a successful family look like? They'll all often tell you um, some kind of, version of you know, what's our goal what are we trying to do it, it's really f families that are really functioning very very well in our culture are springboards for individual success right so if you talk to a dad whose kids have grown up and they're adults now 
often they, you know, we use this metaphor of the nest. They've flown the nest. Hopefully they're successful. They're building their own families. You know, they're off um, serving the Lord or, you know, building a career and, you know, starting their own families. And that's, that's the way we envision family. And that's just what we think family is at its sort of pinnacle is a springboard for individual success. We get back together on Thanksgiving, Christmas, you know, we stay, try to stay in contact and all of that. that. That would have been totally foreign to Abraham. Okay. So, and if you go into the Bible and you just start to read uh, the origin story of the family, which is in Genesis chapter one, you know, when God first created the first family, it's really interesting that what he says or why he even creates a family you know, he's, we know he creates the garden. He goes through the, the days of creation. And in Genesis 1, you know, he blesses this first family, this first man and women, and tells them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and rule. And so he gave all of those, that creation mandate to rule to the family. He didn't, he didn't come up with a, a government. He didn't come up with a business or a nonprofit or an app or whatever. It was like, it was a family. And so he had a purpose. He wanted them to work together. And you see that immediately happening in Genesis chapter two, where, you know, God, God looks at Adam and says, you need a helper. You know, you're working, but you're all by yourself. Like you need somebody to be there. And, um, and so you see that in that first picture of the family, it's multi-generational in that God says, be fruitful and multiply, fulfill the earth and subdue it. That's not a, that's not a mission that Adam and Eve could have done on their own. He's God specifically blessing them to create a multi-generational family. Um, they're, they're a team. In other words, they are designed to work together. God didn't say, okay, once you start, you know, this process, Eve, you're over here working over here, Adam, you're over here. The kids are all going to separate. No, that's not the way that it was originally designed. They were, they were designed to work together. And then the last thing is God gave them a mission, right? To fill the earth and subdue it to rule. And so the first family, God didn't say, this is a springboard for individual success. He said, this is, you know, you're a family, a multi-generational team on mission. Here's your mission. Um, and then you see from the rest of scripture that that's really as people, uh, the families that walked with the Lord, um, to the extent that they were trying to be faithful to God's design, this is what they built. Um, and this is so different, you know, from our culture. I think one of the easiest examples to, to see this is that if you ask most people in our culture, like name your great grandparents, um, it's very difficult for us to do, um, in, in, uh, sort of in Jewish culture or ancient Hebrew culture, that would not have been difficult for them to do. That's why there's so many genealogies in the Bible. Um, There's just a different vision for what family is. Now, there are times where uh, different people who particularly are coming out of idolatry are being called out to, out of their family of origin to start a new family line, right? So Abraham has that call in Genesis 12 Mm -hmm. to leave his father, Terah. We learn that it's because Terah was a... um, was an idol worshiper and uh, the end of Joshua, Joshua says, Hey, our, you know, God is not the, the God of Terah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he gives the call to Abraham, but you see that Isaac, he doesn't leave his father or his father's household. Isaac works with his father. You see that also with Jacob and his son. Um, and you see, you see this, and that, these are descriptions in the Bible of when, when families were healthy, they tended to work together across generations. And, that, that's just the way that families have always been uh, throughout history. The, the only times you see families basically going nuclear, where they have a nuclear family, they've got their, and, and then they hit the reset button every generation where they can't remember any of their ancestors or even a couple of generations previous. That only happens in extremely wealthy societies where um, individualism starts to become even possible. But if tomorrow, you know, there was, you know, we have the coronavirus going nuts right now. And people are talking about the apocalyptic scenarios. If any apocalyptic scenario were to happen tomorrow where people, you know, the economy would start to crash and people really um, couldn't de- depend on, you know, others or the government to, to rescue them, immediately every family would become a multi-generational team on mission. They, they would just do it because they, they would have to take care of their young by themselves. They, they couldn't do it on their own. So they would be leaning on their extended family, particularly their parents who have to care for their parents. Um, they would have to function like a team and their mission. It'd be clear, like in those scenarios, it'd be survival. Um, and then to rebuild society and so what societies tend to do is when there's instability, they build these multi-generational teams on mission. They're very powerful. But what's crazy is that if you take a family and put them in a very wealthy society, that's hyper individualistic um, and you, and that family's able to build a multi-generational team on mission, despite the fact that they could, they could live, you know, alone, they could 
uh, just focus on their nuclear family and hit the reset button. But if they choose to build a multi-generational team instead, it's extremely powerful. Just all of the wealth and opportunities of that society, um, they tend to really catalyze the, uh, that family team. And so across the generations, if you choose to do this in America or in a wealthy country, then your family will thrive in ways that are almost unheard of in our culture. And this is why when you really look across at some of the strongest families or those who have had the biggest impact on ministry, on politics, on business, they tend to be multi-generational family teams. Um, and it's just unfortunate that we have the blueprint right here in our scriptures uh, as Christians, and we are choosing to adopt a much weaker, a much more flimsy, um, and you know what ultimately results in um, a much less influential model of family that's being propagated culturally um, when we could have so much more influence as families and we can work together across generations and experience all the life-giving uh, beauty of living our lives through through family instead of and through our family team instead of just as individuals and so that's where I get really excited about the possibilities for these families to emerge particularly um, amongst strong believers who are following Jesus Wow man that was quite a quite a description and a, a very compelling description too and I want to talk about some more of the particulars and this this may be a tangential thing um, but it really made me think of the family of God and how when you become a Christian, you're immediately adopted into the family of God. And yeah. I can really see the family team thing working in a church context where you have multi-generations, multiple generations of people, maybe not blood related, but related by the blood of Christ, uh, working together yeah. Um in uh, cahoots with one another to raise up uh, the next generation and to support them and to um, perpetuate the gospel and reach it, you know, push it into further areas of the world. Um, Have you, have you ever thought about it in that, in those terms, in that context? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the idea of the church that, Jesus was the first time Jesus described his vision for what this would look like. You know, it, it's in, you know, when the rich young ruler, you know, that story, you know, where mm-hmm. he, Jesus tells him, give everything. And the guy walks away sad because he was wealthy and the, the disciples freak out and they're like, man, you know, like who can be saved? And then Jesus, you know, says with, with man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible because anyone who's left father, mother, brothers, houses, fields for me will fail, will not fail to receive a hundred times more fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, houses, fields, and with those persecutions and along with that eternal life. And so what Jesus, Jesus uh, wanted, and, and in the first century where Jesus lived, family was extremely strong. You can see that in, in the culture. And this is why Jesus oftentimes confronted the, the idol of family, because it was a big problem, you know, amongst Jesus's people of Jesus's day. Um, we have sort of the opposite problem. Family is so weak, we don't even know what it is, let alone how to do it. Um, But in Jesus's day, families tend to be very strong and so strong that it was challenging for for people to come when when there was a collision between their 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 the lordship of Jesus and their family. Mm -hmm. That was often where they had to make, you know, an ultimate decision to follow Jesus. And Jesus used that a lot. But but yeah, to your point, his vision was that the church would look like this, this powerful, amazing, abundant, generous, multi-generational family. And that is what church ought to look like. And that's definitely the, the, when, when Paul's talking Galatians about the household of faith, that's what he's describing. What's really challenging is that if you've never experienced a abundant, generous, multi-generational household, how do you build it? And the way that Paul advocated to build it, he, he says in you know, 1 Timothy 3, well, you find those fathers who have done an awesome job of ordering their households, and then you bring them into oversight over the fam- household of God. Um, they've spent their whole lives, d- decades training in building their own households into these amazing multi-generational teams. They need to now serve the church or the body as these grandfathers who are, you know, elders, overseers, who then will, you know, help make sure that we can create that kind of experience across families. Um, but just like it's so hard to relate to, 
God as father, if you've had a really terrible experience with your biological father, it's very difficult for people to understand church if all their experiences of, of family have been negative or Western or this springboard for individual success or if what family is is something you're essentially always trying to transcend, um, which is really the Western ideal, the individual transcending their family, uh, escaping the orbit of their family and building their idealized individual life. And so, man, that has wreaked havoc on the church because now this is what people want from church. They want church to be an experience where they as an individual are transcending the need to serve the body of Christ and that, that household of faith. Um, and they need to be served as individuals. And how is this, you know, helping me? And, you know, it becomes a very self-centered consumeristic thing. And churches, unfortunately, just like families, tend to restructure themselves in such a way to meet the modern Western um, demands, as opposed to hold, holding on to what, you know, Jesus's ultimate vision was, which was a hundred times more brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers. And this is why Paul constantly referred to like Timothy, you know, as his son. And there was so much familial language in the New Testament mm -hmm. about the church. And I think it really flowed directly out of that first century Jewish um, household kind of experience that people had and really enjoyed in that culture. And we are like living without not, not only not having the experience of family like that, but without the memory of what family was like. Um, and that's, that's, I think, has really caused us to fall short of getting to experience that amazing extended family that the church, I think, was really supposed to be. Wow, man, that, that's, that's pretty interesting. You know, I've, I've always held firmly that the, the family is the basic building block of society of culture of um of the church and and i still feel that way but this just really the things that you're talking about these ideas are really just honing that in and showing how it's even more so the fact that it it really really depends on the family and and a lot of the ways that the family goes is dependent upon how the father goes and how he leads or doesn't right. lead and so I'd, I'd like to get more into what this looks like, because that, that's a very a thing that's really lacking. One of the reasons I started Dad Hackers was because I didn't grow up in a Christian home, but now I'm a Christian. I have a family of my own, a wife. I have five kids as well, um, a little bit younger than yours, but um, I don't have the context of what it looks like to, to be brought up in a Christian home. And so that, that's one of the things I love to do on this podcast is pick the brains of men who have done it, who have passed on the faith, so to speak, to the next generation, who have raised children, who are faithful, who are currently raising the next generation and, and having that multi-generational view. Uh, but, but, but your ideas are, are kind of really exploding that to a, a whole nother level. And so I'd really, really like you to maybe dive into, because I'm assuming you're doing this type of thing with your family um, mm -hmm. if, if you're talking about it so much. So like, what, what does this look like? Like, what does your family look like as a, as a family team on mission? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a process because there's, there's a recovery process and that's that revisioning, you know, we we're talking about earlier. Um, that my family had to go through, that everyone listening to this who, <laughs> who hasn't been raised in a multi-generational family team is going to have to go through. And so for us, you know, I, I kept looking for any tools that were designed for building a family in each of these categories. What tools will build a family multi-generationally? Is there any tools that will help us be a team? Or is there any tools that will help us, you know, be on mission together as a team? Um, and across generations. And so, I, you know, there's probably, you know, five to 10 tools in each of those three areas that our family sort of actively cultivates. Um, but there's sort of, like you said, starting sort of starter tools, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah, um, the starter you know, so for multi <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so that, you know, so for, for multi-generational, I, I always say, and this is definitely where we started, was that, you know, most people's uh, best experience of multi-generational family, if it's positive in their home or, you know, with their parents or with their children or grandchildren downstream, 
oftentimes it happens around holidays, you know, so like um, on Thanksgiving or Christmas, we tend to, you know, get together um, as across generations and we don't know how to do that super well. So sometimes those are really miserable experiences, but um, I know that <laughs> it's a little we try, <laughs> you know, um, to be generational. <clears throat> so living in, living in Jerusalem, um, as I did, like I said, when I was 23 and then, then we've lived there since then on and off for a number of years. You know, what, what we just noticed um, was that um, it was crazy to watch uh, our, you know, friends who are in the 20s and 30s, um, Israelis, who would, whether they were secular or observant, on Friday night, they would all rush home to their parents' home, just like we would have maybe on a Thanksgiving, but they did it every single week. Every Friday night, they were, you know, rushing off to their parents' house, their, where their grandparents were, and having this sort of Shabbat or Sabbath dinner, um, and you know, we were invited to some of those and we were constantly being invited to people's Shabbat dinners or Sabbath dinners. My wife and I were on vacation last month and we ran into an Israeli couple and in the first couple of minutes, they didn't know who we were. And they're just like, oh, you got to come to Shabbat, you know, come to our house. <laughs> like, why? And they were talking about their kids and their grandkids all every week in L.A. They come, we come together and I was, we were so excited. Um, you know, next time we're in L.A., we're going to try to hit them up. Um, but uh, but th- that that is that's what I realized is if you, if you create, if you uh, create a weekly family meal and at that family meal, you, it's laid back, it's fun, it's whatever culture you want to create, it could be pizza night, you know, um, with a movie, you know, but what you want to do is make it sustainable. But it's, it's not like what, what we oftentimes talk about in Western culture is, you know, you know, we should be sort of, as we're kind of scattering everywhere, we should be having weekday dinners together, which totally is great. But we, but what what I'm saying is, um, one meal. It's not about just sort of catching up before we, you know, all go our separate ways, rush to our rooms, go play our video games, you know, watch separate movies. None of that. Like, no, this evening we're staying together, like like we try to do on Thanksgiving, you know. So we're gonna if you if you put that stake in the ground, and as a father right now, if you're listening to this, if you're if you're picturing, I want to craft a, a meal or an experience once a week. It could be any night of the week. I don't, it doesn't matter, but I want to craft a meal so that when my kids grow up and start having kids, they can't, they, they can't imagine not wanting to be there if they're in town. Like they will want to come every week because they, it's just, there's an experience of family that they're going to want, want their kids, our grandkids to have craft that meal. Even if you're in your twenties right now and you've got a baby, like start to craft that weekly meal. If you do that, you will not, you will not be able to stop a multi-generational family from emerging. That's what we learned about in Israel. Like these people, they, the Israelis that we were around, they didn't think about this as a philosophy. They just did Shabbat every single week. They did it really well. And every one of their families that we were around was multi-generational. And what tended to happen at these meals is the the grandparents would often be there and they would start telling family stories and, you know, and they would bridge the gap between generations and, because it was such a sacred time because people kept on, you know, cause it was a rhythm that they were also committed to um, and experiencing as a family. It was just, it was so, it was so shaping uh, of the identity. In fact, this last week I was, um, I was at a, an event with my son, Jackson, he's 19 and some guys were there and they, they asked Jackson, like, you know, how has this impacted you? We were talking about this specific meal. And, and he said um, to these guys, he's like, well, I've never, I've never really had to, I've never really had to find myself or question who I am. A lot of my friends are in that. He's like, I know who I am. I'm I'm, I'm a prior. I know my grandparents. I've I've had a meal with them every single week for as long as I could remember. Um, My great grandmother was at this meal. You know, she was spanning seven generations when she was at that meal. She could remember three upstream generations from her. And she was telling those stories. And then three downstream generations from her were at the meal. Can you imagine having somebody at the table every week that spans seven generations of your family line? And, and we, we have that. Many of you guys listening to this, you have access to that. But you don't have any way of releasing that to, to give your children roots. Um, and so some of you guys may think about this and say, I, I do not, I can't imagine my parents being healthy part of that meal. Like I, I have a hard time with Christmas, let alone once a week. Like that's not going to work for us. Yeah. Um, we, you know, a lot of families are in that spot. And what I tell them is you guys have to understand, um, you know, if, if that's truly where you're at, then the reason you're doing what I'm describing is really for your future grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And what that suggests 
probably is that you're actually not an Isaac generation, you know, that sort of second generation, but you're an Abraham generation because Abraham, he had to leave his father because they had such differences when it came to who they were worshiping. And so that, that's a decision that Abraham made. And so you might be listening to this as an Abraham generation and there are special blessings for, for people that are Abraham generations, but that's, that's one example. That's one tool. Um, but it's my favorite one by far in terms of if you want to take a hyper individualistic family and make it multi-generational, um, that, that's the tool that I would say, um, you will, will, will really start to work for you, but it's, it's a big deal to try to craft a family meal like that every week, but man, it's so worth it. All right, guys, wanted to take a quick second to tell you about the Iron Men Mastermind. If you're looking for a band of brothers that you can lock shields with, that can go to battle with you in the day-to-day life, who are also in the trenches going through the same struggles and the same challenges that you are going through, I suggest you check out the Iron Men Mastermind. This mastermind was developed and designed for Christian men to help us become the men that God has created and called us to be. And it's designed to help us increase our relationship with God, increase our relationship with our wives, increase our relationship with our children, and begin to provide better for them financially, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, relationally, in all of those areas, those areas that those things that wake you up in the middle of the night. These are the kinds of things that we work on. These are the kinds of ways that we can help you out in the Ironman Mastermind. If this is something that is of interest to you, you may want to join the Ironman community and you can check out more information at dadhackers.us slash Ironman, one word, Ironman there. All right, now back to our show. So I have to ask you because um, when I do podcast interviews, lots of times they'll ask me about uh, what I do to engage with with my family. And it's similar to what you describe. Usually on Friday night or Saturday night, we'll we'll do what we call popcorn pajama party. And we eat dinner together. Nice. Uh, and then on a rotating basis, each kid, you know, depending on what week it is, gets to pick a movie that we watch. We pop some popcorn and we watch a movie. Would that fit the description of what you're talking about? I mean, it's just my wife and I and our five kids. Um, but almost every week we, we do it. I mean, there's been a couple weeks where we're, you know, jam packed Friday and Saturday, and that's probably a problem. Um, but, uh, it's been pretty consistent over the years. Does yeah. that, is that in line with what you're talking about? Yeah, <laughs> I think that's great. And I think, like I said, whatever you can sustain, what I would encourage is once you sustain, sustain that and you're you, it's really you figured out like the meal that works your kids are loving it they remind you if you forget you know that kind of stuff oh, yeah. um that's really that's where it starts you know that's when you know you're doing it right um and then some of the things you can start to add if you want to you know maybe you know upgrade it a little bit at a time and this is where i really encourage people mm-hmm. um to dive as deep as they can into what uh, Jewish families have cultivated for thousands of years in terms of how they do this meal. So, so something that, that you'll see most Jewish families do at the beginning of this meal is they bless the sons and daughters. And there's something really special about that. So like, for example, in our house, the oldest person at the meal will, so I just ask the question, we're sitting at the table and, um, and I say, has God blessed our family with any sons, you know, and yeah, the sons. And so then I'll put my hands on you know, my son Jackson or any other boys that are there and just, you know, say over them, may God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh, which is a biblical blessing right out of, um, uh, right out of Genesis 48. And then I just say, they give you the, uh, heart of David, the faith of Abraham and the righteousness of Christ as you build our family from generation to generation. And we have a similar blessing for the daughters God bless our family with any daughters. And so, um, and then my mom or my mother-in-law, you know, used to just be me in April. And we did this with our immediate family for many years before we started incorporating grandparents. Um, and then, yeah, instead of just always doing movie night, now that we have the older generation, we'll have like storytelling, you know, so there might be a prompt and it might be, Hey, like tell us a story. Like it's summertime out. Like what was the summer like for you when you were growing up? And man, like, 
<laughs> you 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 know you have parents that like don't mind sharing story. I mean, they, they can't believe they're being asked these questions and that the kids are sitting there listening, right? Um, and so again, for some of you guys listening to this, that, that maybe that kind of thing might happen just a few times a year, which is great. I would go for it. Um, for us, it started happening every week after we've been doing our Shabbat dinners for probably at least eight years. Um, so we didn't start with in, involving our parents. But and again, if you can't do that, that I would encourage you, like, think about the future, like, what's going to um, craft it in such a way. So what, what I would say to you, Patrick, about the movie and popcorn night is that um, as your kids are getting older, um, then you want to start crafting this, this meal in such a way that, that they would want to come over to your house with their kids. And so whatever that looks like, that's the most important thing is that, um, that there's identity sharing across the generations and that it's so fun and so life-giving that they would want to share it, you know, across their generations. Um, and that, hey, guys, every, every week we're going to be here. We're going to be, you know, we're going to be popping popcorn. We're going to be hanging out. We're going to be telling stories. Sometimes we'll be watching movies. Like, um, and I've been, you know, really inspired over the years in our uh, dinners just to begin to include more and more, um, you know, uh, biblical elements or just elements of the faith into the meal. But, I, you know, again, I wouldn't start there, especially if the kids are really little and you're just trying to figure it out. Make it simple. Make it fun. Um, again, if your kids are asking, Hey, what's that thing? Like, let's do that again. You know, like add, add little elements so that you, they can have a deep experience of family that is really, when they think about family, they think about that night. They think, yes, that's when my dad, he wasn't on his phone. He wasn't thinking about something else. He didn't have some, some place better to do or something better to go to. He just hung out with us every single week at that meal. And it was just magical. And that's what you want. Yeah, that sounds uh, really, really awesome and, and desirable. And and I like how you talk about it as being something that when your kids are older and they have kids of their own, it's something that they would want to come back to your house to continuously to participate in. Yeah. So y- you've mentioned this this idea of Shabbat or Sabbath. It, in in your home and in in your context and rhythm, is it is it focused around this meal or is it actually like a full day Sabbath type of thing? Yeah. So I, I think where, where a lot of people start, I'd encourage that, like, I just call this the weekly family meal we've been talking about. Mm-hmm. Now in our family, it does kick off a 24 hour period of rest. So, um, and that's a different tool. I would say for a lot of Western families, that's a pretty advanced tool gotcha. to bring online. Like you don't have to do that. Um, to start doing the family meal that like you guys are doing, Patrick, or that my family does. Um, we definitely started doing the meal before we started to really figure out how to rest. That was like a, a long journey for us. Lots mm-hmm. and lots of, um, of, uh, of thoughts, the, both theologically and practically have gone into try to figuring out how to do that. But yeah, what we do is um, if you read in Genesis, um, the Sabbath, and this is true, you know, within uh, Jewish, the Jewish world as well. And that is that, that in the Bible, the evening or the next day starts in the evening, right? So that's why in the Genesis 1, it says there was evening and there was morning the first day. Now there was morning, there was evening, which is the way we do it. So in, in, uh, in their culture, um, Saturday, if that's their Sabbath, actually begins on Friday night when it gets dark. Um, and then Sunday begins when it gets dark on Saturday night. And so um, I love that rhythm in terms of resting. So, so the, the whole day of rest is kicked off with this meal on Friday night. And so our Sabbath, we, we used to do it from Saturday night to Sunday night. And uh, now we do it from Friday night to Saturday night. I don't think it matters exactly when, which day, but um, like it's just, we talked about earlier, whichever one works. But yeah, it kicks off a, a day of rest for us. Um, and we've really crafted Saturday, try to dial that in to make it, you know, really fun and sustainable for our family. It's not a day of, all the things you can't do. A lot of people, when they hear about that, they're like, oh man, my parents made me do that when I was, you know, they told me Sunday was the day that, you know, I hated the most because I couldn't do all this stuff. Um, for our kids, just like the meal, their favorite day of the week is, is, the, is Saturday. And we, we do a lot of fun stuff. It's very restful and very engaging, <clears throat> very relationally building and a lot of fun. But that, that, that took a long time to figure out how to do that. Yeah, I, I could see there's a lot of hurdles that if I'm thinking about taking an entire 24 hour period off, there are lots and lots of hurdles and planning and preparation and 
conversations and hard choices that would have to go down. So I could see how that, that would be an advanced technique, if you will, uh, in this whole family, uh, family teams type of thing. Are there, is there maybe another, uh, I don't know, introductory tool that, that you usually tell people to get started with? Yeah. So we, we've been talking a lot about multi-generational, um, but family is also supposed to be a team. So how do you go from a collection of individuals where all your kids are doing different stuff to being a team? That's a real, that's something that really takes. Um, and so I would say the, the basic tool, um, the first starter tool <clears throat> that I, I tell dad is um, it's very difficult. If, if Abraham were to suddenly get on a time machine and be in our, like, like in, in saw a modern dad, I think he would be very, very confused. <laughs> and if he looked across our culture and tried to find um, an example for what, what he did as a dad, what it was like to be a father, how he thought of himself, I, I think that probably the closest <clears throat> analogy to what we're all familiar with in our culture to what he actually did was the, was the modern coach. So if you think about a coach, <clears throat> it's, it's crazy, um, you know, the uh, – when, my son, when he was seven years old, we did a season of football. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I remember the first day I, I, I drove up to the, um, the, uh, the, my son's football practice. <clears throat> and up to this point, you know, I was really, I sort of bought the, the line that, that men just don't like kids or they don't, they don't jive with kids, maybe kids a little bit more uh, for, you know, exciting, exciting to mothers or women. Um, and then dads kind of have to force themselves. Well, as soon as I stopped, you know, at this practice and, and brought my son, you know, getting seven years old, didn't know anything about football. I'd noticed the first thing I noticed was there was as many dads at this practice as there was um, little boys. You know, it's one of the earlier practices, but like all of a sudden these three dads ran over to my son Jackson and met him and they spent the next three hours training him in every detail of like how to stand, how to, you know, <laughs> cause he did not know anything. But it was just, I just sat there and watched these guys with just crazy amounts of passion train my son. And I had this epiphany, you know, which was, um, I don't think the problem is that men don't like children. I think the problem is that men don't know that they're coaches. Like they don't realize that they're coaching a team. Um, and they, they don't understand that that's what fatherhood actually is, is that essentially you're being given um, ownership of a team. Like you're, you're, you're being handed a team. And so I would say the tool is to take on the identity of a coach and see what happens. Like, if you think about this, this thought experiment, um, like if all of a sudden, imagine this, if every dad in America tomorrow were to wake up and instead of thinking of themselves as a dad, right, they thought of themselves as a coach. And <clears throat> what that meant was that their family would have to go to a park every Saturday morning and compete against a similar family with similar age kids in some game. And the, and the results of the score of that game would be made public every single week. What would happen to men's engagement with their family? Um, and I, oh, wow, I just yeah. can't imagine what, <laughs> like it would just erupt. Skyrocket. Like, yeah. They would be, they'd come home every single week, every single day and like coach practice, you know, they would get to that. They, they would look forward to Saturday. You know, not, I know that not all of us are sporty. I'm not super sporty either. Um, but I just, I, I have the imagination and I do enjoy, you know, uh, coaching and I do enjoy like building teams or being on teams. And I think, I think that most men are actually, they're looking around for other teams to be on. That's why we, they are obsessed with sports or they become workaholics or become, you know, or they medicate it through like video games or whatever. I think what's happening is we don't know who we are. Like we actually, so it's been, our identity has been sort of stripped. Um, and it used to be that, that this is the way that, that, fathers thought of themselves and so so start to think about your family as your your team your primary team and begin to take on that identity of the coach and really start to spend time and if you could find an environment in which that actually starts to happen like I did this I actually started doing sports that I'd never had any interest in but they just there's a handful of sports where they actually will just take your whole family <laughs> even the different age groups um, one of them we did for two years was Taekwondo. Um, so we got trained. Um, Kyra, I think, was four. And then Kelsey was our oldest at the time. And she was something like 15. 
and you know, my kids went through, got black belts and, you know, I, me and April did it right along with them. I just wanted to have the experience of coaching my, my family um, and being with my family in that environment. And we did it for, you know, about a year with tennis um, where our kids were on double teams together. Um, I just was looking for any of those environments in which they could work together as a team. I could function more like a coach so that I could practice this. And now I would say, you know, it's, it's a little different. Now we have these weekly family meetings where we're strategizing together, like, um, much more of our spiritual mission, like how are, you know, how are we going to, what, what kinds of things are we going to do, um, this month, this year, and what kinds of, you know, so there's a bunch of those that we've, we've, we've got, uh, where we get to really minister or go on mission as a family, um, you know, sometimes overseas, other times, you know, here, um, but, um, and sometimes we do it completely as a group. Sometimes it'll be me and two or three of the kids, but, uh, it's, that's the environment that I'm always looking for. That would be the, the second is just take on the identity of a coach. Think about your family like a team. Begin to like bring them together as a team, debrief things together, find uh, ways to have fun together, find challenges you can take on together. Um, and, and, uh, and if you start to do that and you let that sort of coach part of your heart get redirected toward your family, it's, it's really, really fun. And I think it starts to make sense of the way men are wired and how, men are actually designed to lead families. It makes sense if you begin to think of it more like a coach and less like the modern dad. Yeah, man, I, I totally agree that that makes a lot of sense. It's funny that you mentioned you guys took Taekwondo. My wife and I, uh, we enrolled our kids in, in karate. Uh, they've probably been doing it for about two years now. And she and I just decided to get involved with them and, and do their family night on Friday nights as well. And uh, she and I, so far, we've done two classes together with the kids, but it, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a trip. I, I was whooped pretty bad uh, the first night. It looks, yeah. looks a lot easier than it is. But I totally can see what you mean um, about working together with your family. You're not just sitting there watching your kid play football. You're participating okay. with them um, in that activity. And then you, you kind of all have that common goal to get to the next belt or the next stripe on your belt together and uh you really build that that family camaraderie if you will on that yeah 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 it's huge that's awesome you guys are doing that yeah it's so much fun to to get to figure out and like i said those are those are really difficult it's difficult to find though that's great they have a family night even that is really we we did like even the place we went to didn't have a family night we had to actually i do like find a particular um, place that was willing to do private lessons with our whole family. Um, that was the only way we could all do it together, which is, mm. you know, so you, you kind of have to be creative. You have to be a little stubborn. You have to look around a lot. Yeah. Um, that takes uh, work. Kind of places. Like, yeah. Take your whole family. But again, it's like, man, it's a huge deal. Like if one of my kids wants to go out for a sport, you know, we're like, okay, like there's, we have a certain amount of bandwidth for that stuff but not a ton, but man, if, if we could find something to do as a family, all seven of us, then I'm like, we're in, like, we're going to like commit, you know, like, and so our kids have just learned that that's the kind of activity that, you know, our family is going to really invest in. Um, and we'll do some stuff on the side for them as individuals, but it's really important that we not just go hyper individual and just say, look, um, the, the family will always lose and the individual will always win. It's really important to understand like that is what, that is a deep doctrinal belief of the modern Western family is that the individual, the, the, the individual must not suffer for the family. The family must always um, be weaker and, you know, its priorities must be lower than the individual. Are you doing something wrong? Um, and that, that intuition is so destructive. And so big part of just, um, beginning to build a family differently is to resist and really, um, come out of that belief and, and really adopt the way that God designed family to be, um, and say, look, no, I, I, and this is as dads, you know, you guys can make a decision about whatever kind of family you want to build. Like if you want to build a modern Western family. Like you can do that. And that's, that's probably what will happen if, if you don't, 
make some pretty intense decisions. But you can pick to build a different family. You can decide to build a multi-generational team on mission as the way that you're building your family. Um, you know, it's free country. And so like, it's really <laughs> great to know that you have that choice, but a lot of us don't take advantage of that maybe because we don't know about it or maybe because it's a lot of work. Um, and so a lot of what I want to do is inspire dads and say, Hey, don't, it's not a, a, a like a flip, a switch you have to flip overnight, but mm-hmm. if you find yourself attracted to this, or if you like, in my case, just believe it's actually the architecture that God had in mind. It just, I, I was really convinced theologically first, Oh, this is, this now makes sense. This is why the Bible is essentially a multi-generational family story. This is what God designed. And I began to embrace that. And, you know, and then I had the energy to begin to um, work out those creative challenges of how in the heck do you live that in modern Western culture? Yeah, it, it's, um, I, I think we're so entrenched in the way that we do family and that individualistic mindset that it's, it's a huge paradigm shift to think in terms of family teams and then actually to live it out practically on a day-to-day basis is an extremely overwhelming sounding um, pursuit, if you will. And so I, I really like how you gave a couple you know, real tangible action steps, like think of yourself as a coach and begin doing a family meal together and just start somewhere and begin incorporating this family team concept or mindset or practice into what you're already doing. And then as you go, you can begin to knock off different chunks and uh, implement new things and maybe prune some things that need to go. Um, But I mean, it's so deeply entrenched in, in Western culture, this individualistic mindset. And I really like how you, you describe the family as a collection of individuals rather than a team that, that really, really um, puts it together very well. Uh, Jeremy, we got to wind down here, but if guys want to get a hold of your content, find out more about you, get a hold of your book, of course, I'll link this stuff up in the show notes, but where's, where's the best place that guys can go to find out more? Yeah. So if you go to familyteams.com, you can look, see all the resources. We have several courses. We have like an online um, membership site called Homeroom where we, we basically bring one new tool a month that you can consider sort of almost like installing into your family team if, if that's so it's much more paced. Um, we do these family teams weekends. Those are super helpful. Um, we, we're doing one in Waco, one in Seattle, and also one in Cincinnati this year. So if you're close to any of those cities or you can get to one of those cities, um, it's a day and a half, and it's really, really important to do this with your spouse in a way where you guys are learning together. And then at that weekend, we help you implement the first three tools. Um, and like we talked about, the family revision book is on Audible, and that's on Amazon. You can follow us on Instagram. Um, I'm on there too. So, yeah, there's a lot of places. We're, it's really important not to try to do this alone. It's really important to, to engage in, uh, in whatever you can to be constantly reminded and then equipped. Um, and my friend Jeff uh, Besky and I, we've got a couple of podcasts, one called Five Minute Fatherhood. So three, three times a week, we just drop sort of a fatherhood bomb <laughs> out there. Uh, and uh, we also have a podcast called Dad's Building Teams. And that's, those are long form interviews like this one where I just usually interview a dad who spent the last five or 10 years trying to figure this out. And I have him walk through his journey. Um, and that's mm-hmm. a big deal because I, why I did all those interviews is just, I know how hard this is. And so there, there are every kind of dad on there. There's dads who work full time, entrepreneur dads, sport dads, non-sport dads, like, um, you know, guys who work in construction, like all kinds of different, um, examples. So that's on at dad's building teams. If you guys kind of want to hear a few stories about guys who have, you know, sort of taken a blue pill and are, have gone for it. Cool, man. Yeah, I'll, I'll link all that stuff up in the show notes uh, so you guys can easily easily find everything you have. So, Jeremy, one, one final question uh, before we wrap it up. And I, I like to ask everybody this question. And um, in your opinion, Jeremy, what makes a great dad? <laughs> man. 30 seconds or less. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Man, yeah. I'll, do, I'll, I'll t- tell you this, my, the, kind of the first thing that came to mind. Um, sure. Yeah. I think I think you have to be a good, a good son to be a good dad, um, and so the way that, um, like, 
like when I think about my, my relationship with the father, um, I am constantly trying to understand what it, what it is for me to go deep in my identity as the son of, of my heavenly father and cultivate that relationship and just allow that to be, um, to be really the foundational identity of my life. If I operate out of other identities, I just notice like I'm striving. I'm like, I, I become a different kind of person. I'm, 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 I become somebody who's really almost being controlled um, by other idols or other things. And so I have to every morning just like recenter myself as like, you know, I am loved by my father. He's got a mission for me. I'm in his family. I'm in his family line. I'm receiving my identity from him because of what Jesus did. I'm a fully adopted son of the father. And um, I think really good sons make really good fathers. Makes a lot of sense, man. Thank you. Uh, well, Jeremy, we're going to wrap it up here. I, I thank you so much for all your wisdom and insight. And guys, if you um, got value out of this, I suggest you grab his book. And while you're grabbing it, I'll link it up in the show notes. But while you're grabbing it, make sure you you uh, give him a review on Amazon. That always is a nice little thing uh, to be able to do to, to, to pay back a little bit for all the knowledge and, and value and wisdom you're going to get. But uh, Jeremy, thank you so much for coming on the show, brother. I really appreciate it. And I'd love to have you back sometime and, and dig deep into uh, maybe talking about family mission, uh, mission statements and, and j- just yeah. whatever else we can about, about family, man. But thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Absolutely. I loved it. It's a great conversation. Thanks, Patrick. All right, man. Take care. All right, gentlemen, that's all we have for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope our conversation was a blessing to you and that you leave this episode better equipped to be the man and the father God has called and created you to be. If so, then I ask that you please leave us a five-star rating and a quick written review in iTunes. And make sure you head on over to the show notes to get all of the resources for this episode. While you're there, you can take part in our five days to be a better dad challenge, as well as get involved with our free Facebook community. All right, gentlemen, until next week, remember Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Stay sharp.